Hello my friends and welcome to Practice English with Paul. Yet again it's our weekly video for the 22nd of August 2015. A few things today. Uh, an update about Facebook. Um, we have some book reviews, upcoming videos and problems with prepositions as always. Now, okay, starting with Facebook. Um, now, I was a bit stupid before because I didn't know that a private page had a 5,000 friend limit. And unfortunately, I can't befriend new people. So I was shocked when suddenly the 150 people stopped um, uh, contacting me. And I realized this, and so I have opened a Practice English with Paul public page. You can type it into uh, the search engine in Facebook or similarly um, on my private page I have got my last post which is a link. Click the link and move over to the public page. I will be posting all my information there from now on, not on my private page. Also, in addition, I can uh, contact all of you a lot better. I can do a lot more uh, interesting things for you guys. Okay, so that's why I'm going to do that. As for who can post, because with a public page, anybody can post. Um, of course, if you're going to try and post something on my page, which says, hello everybody, I hope you had nice breakfast, here's a picture of my eggs, um, I will not post it at all, I'll just delete it. Um, if you have something of educational value, like some uh, handouts, some, some visual, uh, maybe some exercise that you would like to put on my page, send it, I will check it, and if it's good, I will add it to the page. Absolutely no problem. Uh, I would like input from other people, but again, it must be of ed educational value. That's what makes the page so special, because as I said in my previous videos, there is so much rubbish online. I want to have a community where we really, really learn English. Okay, so that's the issue with Facebook. Again, practice English with Paul, public page. Okay, book review time. Okay, there are three books I want to tell you about. The first books are fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Now, my friends, uh, some of you say, I have problems reading English. Um, maybe because you're reading something which is a bit too hard for you. If you are a pre-intermediate student, and you're reading Charles Dickens, good luck. Um, because even if I was going to read Dostoevsky in Russian, uh, I think I would have some serious problems. So you need to find books to suit your level. Now, Oxford University Press and Cambridge University Press have answered our prayers. Um, for example, Oxford University Press have got what's called um, graded readers. For example, this, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It is a small book, okay, it's not very big at all, um, and most importantly, the English has been sort of catered for a particular level. In this case, it says on the back here, maybe you can see, it says stage four, which is intermediate level, and a lot of the books come with audio CDs. For example, this one I have by Cambridge University Press called uh, Staying Together. It comes with uh, three audio CDs so you can listen as you're reading to really practice your pronunciation, to practice your skills. I will even do a special video on how to use these together. And again, here on the back of this, just to sort of show you, it gives a fantastic guide here. It tells you that the English in this book is graded to uh, the European framework B1, which is the Cambridge PET, pre pre I can't say it, the preliminary English test, intermediate level English. So if your level is intermediate, you go to the bookshop, take it off the shelf, look on the back, ah, uh, that's for me, buy it, read it, listen to it. And if you go to uh, Cambridge website, and it's the English, uh, English readers, as you can see, uh, there are hundreds of these. Oxford University Press as well. There are hundreds of them. So just type into Google Oxford University Press graded readers or Cambridge University Press English readers. You will find hundreds of these books. I suggest you buy them and read them and listen to them as well. It will really, really help your English. Okay. 
Good. That's those. Next one, IELTS Trainer. Now, many of my friends and students on the Contactia and Facebook are preparing for IELTS exams. I teach IELTS, I enjoy teaching IELTS quite a lot. Um, again, people ask me what is one of the best books to use when preparing for the IELTS exams. This is one of them. As usual, it is the IELTS Trainer. Okay, you've probably seen this. It is a very, very popular book. Again, by Cambridge University Press. I think Cambridge University Press should give me half of Cambridge because I seem to promote them quite a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, this book is pretty good. It's still not the real exam, I feel. Um, again, I will show you some other books um, where, like, where you have real past exam papers. And I think if you check one of my previous weekly videos, I actually show one of those. Um, I think for IELTS or FCE or something like that. The trainers are good because, again, you know, they give you uh, lots of sort of say, uh, here, they give you like sort of an action plan, they give you tips on how to answer that particular piece, and in this case, it's listening. So it gives you some strategies that you need for the exam because unfortunately English isn't enough. You need to know how the exam works and you need to be well prepared. And so the IELTS trainer is very good for this. And it has six tests for you to practice. Again, as I said, the tests aren't as hard as you would find in other areas or other books, but it is still very good for practicing the structure of the exam, which is extremely important, okay? And again, um, they have answer keys at the back of the book. Um, and also, I'm just going to make sure, I hope they have this. Um, yes, they have the tape scripts as well. And from this, I am blind. I can't see. Oh, yes, I can. Here we go. Yes, they have the sample answer sheets. Um, and in the sample answer sheets, you photocopy those every time you do a test. Get used to answering the tests and copying your answers to the answer sheet within the time limits. Okay, so again, if you're doing IELTS, get this IELTS Trainer by Cambridge University Press. Okay, the last one, again, related to IELTS. This is called uh, Numbers, Data and Statistics for the Non Specialist. It's by Collins. And you'll see here in the corner, EAP, English for Academic Purposes. Now, English for Academic Purposes is a relatively recent um, area that uh, people are beginning to teach more, so therefore books are being created for this area. What it is is that a lot of people want to go to university in a different country and study, especially in English. And these books generally prepare students uh, for that sort of academic style of English. Now this one, it really um, is to help you with sort of statistics. So, going back to IELTS, um, this is something I strongly recommend because if you are doing IELTS, you know, or you should know, in part one of your writing, you may have to describe a graph or a pie chart or a trend. Now, if I just sort of randomly open to this book, I say randomly, I'm looking through pages now because before it actually worked randomly, I'm trying to find a graph, um, which I did earlier. Okay, here for example, if I bring this close up. Here we see two graphs on this page and here we actually see some language, I can't show you too close because it's copyright, but here we actually see some examples of language that can be used to describe these graphs. Now, with a whole book full of that, by studying that language, you would make your part one IELTS writing so awesome that you would just push up your mark, okay? Because, you know, it's easy to say, in this graph, I can see the uh, y-axis and the x-axis and the Profit is increasing very much. Ugh. You know, it shot up dramatically and leveled out and bottomed out or, or reached, a, reached a pitch or reached a peak. You know, that's what you want this for. All right. Um, again, you can find it online. 
and one last time it's called Numbers, Data and Statistics for the Non-Specialist by Collins, uh, English for Academic Purposes. Okay? Good. Now we have number three, upcoming videos. Yes, now, immediately after I have finished this weekly news video, I am going to do a video on the difference between often and often for pronunciation, because some people say it's American, some people say it's British, but actually, I'm going to surprise you with this. It will be a short video, but very, very useful, um, because people ask me all the time, so I'm going to make a video about it. I'm going to do a video on causatives. Uh, causatives is like to have something done. I had my car washed. Uh, my sister had her hair cut. It's like passive. You'll always find it together with passive, but it's not passive, um, but very similar. I'm going to do, unfortunately, thanks to my dear Russian friends, um, a video, uh, a video, videos on articles, probably about 500 of them. Um, because there was a poll on the Kontaktia, uh, my dear Russian friends, Ukrainians, Kazakhstans, whoever, um, uh, Kazakhs, so excuse me, um, voted in the poll and chose articles. So, yes, I am currently preparing a huge list of videos on articles in English, because for those of you around the world, uh, you might not know that Russian doesn't have a and the, um, and they often make mistakes with them. Um, and in fact, many people do, and it's important to get it right in English. Uh, it takes a very, very long time, but I'm going to create some really, really useful videos um, and a bit of practice to go with them, okay? And I think one more video I'm going to do in the next two days, vocabulary, how to agree, disagree, weak and strong agreement and disagreement. For example, I totally agree, spot on, or to be honest, or yes, but, Things like this that you can use in your everyday English, plus in your exams, most importantly. Okay? And finally, prepositions. Somebody on Facebook asked me what's the difference between some of these prepositions. On or at the weekend. Well, everybody on the internet says on is American English, at is British English, but because American English has influenced British English quite a lot, you will find many British people probably saying both. Um, it depends on the user. Um, or, if you want, if you want to refer to the weekend, you could even say over. What did you do over the weekend? Uh, very, very common. Um, I'm not sure about American English, but British English, very common. Over the weekend. In or on a car or bus. Now, I created my own theory about this. Uh, and I'm, some of my students know about it already, but I'll, sh I'll share it with all of you. Now, why do we say in a car but on a bus? What's the difference? Because you're inside the object, you're inside the vehicle. Why is the preposition different? So, my theory, and this is what I've created, if somebody else has created this theory, I'm sorry, I haven't copied, but uh, anyway, um, imagine like a car is generally smaller, a helicopter is smaller, because we say in a helicopter, in a car, okay? We say uh, maybe in a boat if it's small, right? Because you need to climb into it. So you open the door and you climb into a car. You sort of open the door and climb into a helicopter. Now, on a bus, on a train, on a plane, the door opens and you don't climb into it unless it's a very small bus, but you step onto it, okay? You step onto a bus. When the plane is here, you step onto the plane. So, I believe we take the preposition from this movement, okay? Therefore, I'm on the plane. Um, if you, because uh, uh, I know a lot of uh, other languages, if you say I'm on the plane, that means I'm sitting outside on top of it, which isn't a good idea. They say in the plane, but not in English. I'm on the plane, I'm on the train, I'm on the metro, okay? Uh, and in the car. Do you understand? I think it's quite clear, okay? And the thing is, you just need to learn them by heart, okay? So, in a, in a car, in a helicopter, in a boat, maybe on a boat if it's big, because you step onto the boat, then on the boat. Um, but on a bus, on a train, on a plane. On or by foot. By talks about a uh, method of transport, uh, like how, how you travel. Um, now, 
we say like by car, I travel to work by car, not by train, or I travel abroad broad by plane, not by boat. Um, but with foot, always on foot. I go to work on foot because your feet aren't really a kind of motorized method of transport. So we just say on, on foot. Um, and a lot of people make mistakes with that, okay? So I think that's it. That ends the weekly news show for this week. Uh, and again, my friends, if you would like me to mention something for next week, please leave your uh, comments under this video in YouTube because if you start sending me hundreds of messages in Facebook, I promise they will get lost because as I say every week, I do not have time to answer a thousand messages. Um, okay, so please leave your ideas under the weekly videos and I'll be happy to answer them. So thank you my friends, please subscribe, please like, uh, enjoy learning English, I'm happy to be here to help you. Have a good day and goodbye.